Hello, everyone, and welcome to Peace Wanakism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you can also find me on theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. Uh, so today we have Skylar Collins um, coming in from Utah, is it? Salt Lake City, Utah, yeah. Salt Lake City, yeah, right. Um, uh, he is a voluntarist and radical unschooler of three kids, a nine-year-old, five-year-old, and an eight-month-old. Uh, he's got a website, everythingvoluntary.com. Uh, he's got two books he's written, or booklets. He, he calls them No Hitting, A Short Guide on Why Spanking is Unnecessary, and Toward a Free Society, A Short Guide on Building a Culture of Liberty. Uh, and he also uh, runs a website, largeprintliberty.com, where he uh, publishes large editions of um, libertari libertarian books. Um, and... And, and he's got a, another book coming out uh, at the end of August um, before the school year uh, called, well he, well, he hasn't figured out the name, but it, the topic is going to be on unschooling and perhaps focused on more the father side because, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> you know the, the, the mother does play a role, but definitely, you know, without the father, it's just a, it's a lost cause, you know. <laughs> you, need the, you need the cohesive unit, right? Man and woman definitely. together, definitely. So, yeah. so Skyler, uh, thanks, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, um, so maybe before we get started, um, just share with the, the listeners, um, you know, your path to volunteerism. You know, what what got you interested in it, and and what books, podcasts, you know, uh, turned you, uh, you know, transformed your way of thinking. Well, my my journey began when I um, started reading the weekly columns of Walter Williams and Thomas Sowell two uh, black economists and they would write a lot on race and economics you know and other things um, Walter Williams um, more explicitly identifies as libertarian Thomas Sowell is probably more of a Hayekian conservative I'd say um, anyways but they got me interested in economics and so I, I bought Sowell's basic economics and devoured that um, and that really kind of jump started me I, I started to recognize how the effects of government regulations and interventions in the economy were, you know, basically making things worse for a lot of people. I mean, things like minimum wage, things like rent, rent control and other other things like that, licensing laws. And so then I, I started to identify these regulations as, as wrong. And so that's that's when I then discovered the libertarian philosophy. So then I, I went through libertarianism and then you know, like like most people who go through there, they eventually find anarchism, and you know when they start applying the, the libertarian principles consistently, that's when they they become anarchists, and then and then from there, I I you know first heard of this this philosophy called voluntarism, and it it's a little easier to swallow just semantically with with the name voluntarism versus anarchism, because anarchism you know generates a lot of a lot of different kinds of thoughts with. with you know, your typical person. And so, um, you know, and then I started reading more voluntarist writing and kind of learning more about the differences between voluntarism and, and voluntarist focus on, uh, focus away from electoral politics as well as the focus on nonviolence um, as, as a means of, you know, active resistance um, and that sort of stuff. So I, I kind of read a lot of that. Um, Carl Watner, who publishes The Voluntarist, um, newsletter um, a few times a year. Um, he's been doing that since the 80s. Um, I, I read a lot of that stuff and that's when I started the website everythingvoluntary.com because um, I wanted to kind of have a central place. So it was also um, after I had um, discovered voluntarism and I started identifying as a voluntarist, um, a friend of mine introduced me to a book on parenting called Unconditional Parenting by Alfie Cohn. Now Alfie Cohn is I think he's just a typical progressive liberal, but he's written a lot on the demerits of um, punishments and rewards in in parenting as well as in schooling. You know, he's written against like the grade system and that kind of stuff. Anyway, so I read that and that's when I was like, okay, me using um, authoritarian parenting, spanking, timeouts, that sort of stuff. Number one, it's inconsistent with my political beliefs, right? If I believe in the voluntary principle or the non-aggression principle and here I am use you know violating that in my own house um but but what he also convinced me of was 
that not doing those things is a better way to parent. It's a more effective way to parent um, when you replace those tools with better tools. And so that turned me into a peaceful parent. And, you know, and then I would buy other books and read those and, and do what I can to study that and, and again, start practicing them. Um, at some point, um, um, I discovered uh, Parent Effectiveness Training by Thomas Gordon, which is, which is the go-to recommendation I give these days because that gives you um, quite a few tools uh, in your parenting, um, whereas the Alfie Cohn book is more theoretical and it's not as pract- not as practically useful, um, although it was a, a very good, you know, shove in the right direction for me. Um, you know, so I I started to realize that putting my kids in school and you know where schools are going to introduce rewards and punishments, which is what I was trying to get away with at home, I thought that's going to be counterproductive. So I want to look at other things besides school as well as I was already fearing school because of the government aspect because they are government schools and I didn't want my kids learning government versions of of history and so forth. So that's when I started looking at, you know, different homeschool philosophies and I read a book called Thomas Jefferson Education. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, no. where they talk about structuring um, time but not content. And so it's 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 semi unschooling, a uh, semi unschooling approach um, to childhood education. It was from there that I I discovered um, unschooling and then radical unschooling, and that's when I was like, okay, this is all completely consistent. Number one, with my principles and values, and number two, this is. Can, this is probably the most com- compatible form of learning um, for our, uh, spe- you know, for us as a species. You know, Peter Gray, um, who writes for Psychology Today, he's he's written a lot on the evolutionary um, aspect of of play based learning models and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, I was like, okay, this is you know, this is what I want to do, and so I did what I could to. Um, I guess you could say convince my wife, although she's she's definitely been the reluctant one in our house, um, which isn't typical, um, which is why I'm I'm doing the book that I'll I'll explain in a minute. Um, and so that's that's when we decided to do that, and we gave my my son. He was starting kindergarten at the time, and he went a, he went a week, and then we went on vacation for a couple of weeks, and then when we came back, he we gave him the option, and he, and he said he wanted to stay home. So they've they've been home ever since. Um, you know, just just having a good time, and we do what we can to facilitate their interests. We do what they can to um, help them have a joyful life. Um, is kind of a, is kind of our goal, and then you know the rest kind of follows after that. So, yeah, that's kind of the journey in a nutshell, I guess you could say. Nice. You know, one thing I um, I realized when you were saying uh, when you were you know talking about your journey is that these all these things like libertarianism, voluntarism, anarchism, uh, peaceful parenting. Um, you know, unschooling to me, and I think maybe for you also right now, um, it it's like they all gel together, right? They meld mm-hmm. into one, right? And yeah. but the thing is, they're not one; they're separate concepts, and we we learn them separately. <laughs> you know, we had to understand all these things separately, right? And it's kind of yeah, interesting. We, yeah, go ahead. we learn them separately, and you're gonna learn, you know, really good peaceful parenting advice and really good radical unschooling advice from non-libertarians, you know. I, I would say most of the, the big name writers in those two areas are are probably progressive liberals. You know, a lot of them are even in Canada in the unschooling. I mean, there's a lot of mm-hmm. um, unschooling um, writing that comes out of Canada. There's kind of a, a really big um, unschooling community, community up there. Um, and so you, uh, it is interesting. And the reason that's the case is because when the homeschooling movement was sort of taken off through the 60s and 70s, you had the conservatives going to homeschooling, you know, because they wanted to teach religion and keep their kids out of the secular schools. But then you had sort of the progressive liberals wanting to homeschool, but because homeschooling was um, affiliated and associated with the religious right, they discovered, an, you know, unschooling and kind of went in that direction, you know, kind of hands off education as well as religion Mm -hmm. and so that's kind of why you have that liberal progressive strain among um you know veteran radical unschoolers today which is i find it's kind of interesting so but you do have a lot these days the last few years i've definitely seen a lot of libertarians and anarchists learn the idea and then want to move in that direction and so 
Um, that's what I've been doing since 2011 when I started the site is, is trying to promote these philosophies together as one um, overall life philosophy, really. As well as when you add things like nonviolent communication to it when, it, when you're talking about just um, interpersonal um, relationship skills and that kind of thing, too. So yeah, It's all about uh, remaining logically consistent or right with your principles yeah. right and uh and <laughs> in in a sense you know i guess any every statist um is not logically consistent that's the problem right government is the exception or or even let's say a liberal or uh, or a conservative who's who's uh, homeschooling or unschooling you know their kids are the ex or you know they, they they don't they don't use what they advocate in government they don't apply that to their kids <laughs> you know the the violence they 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 um how do you say it's um they exempt it from their kids right so then if they if they expand that nonviolent approach then they would become volunteers <laughs> right yeah yeah <laughs> so so yeah go ahead <laughs> yeah so yeah i'm definitely trying to um do what i can to to promote i guess the philosophy of liberty on all on all fronts um and and to raise a generation of of libertarians of anarchists of of and this is what the my first booklet toward a free society is about when if we want to achieve a free society, we've got to build a culture of liberty. And I think that can only be done through peaceful parenting and radical unschooling. I think kids need to learn to expect freedom if they're going to feel moral outrage towards its denial. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. like like my kids now, because they have been given so much freedom, I mean, and, and I've said this before, my daughter, almost to an annoying extent, <laughs> she will insist on her rights even if they're rights that she's only had for five seconds you know <laughs> immediately it's like how dare you take this from me it's mine you know uh, you know so i really like although it's kind of annoying um, because i think she's still of course learning the social graces and that sort of thing um she does definitely um know how to assert her boundaries once she believes that you know once she knows where those boundaries are she's very assertive of them and i i like to see that and i think that that's the way we need to prepare our children to, to grow up, not only to keep them personally safe among, you know, petty criminals out there, but also among the, the giant criminals out there as well, at least to the extent that they can see what they're doing and recognize it for what it really is rather than being taught that, you know, social contract theory and, you know, the government is like, it's like our parents and they take care of us and blah, 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 the things that you learn in school. Um, Uncle, and so I think Uncle Sam, he's, he's just your uncle. <laughs> He's just yeah, he's, he's just yeah, he's, he's just uh, <laughs> he's a nice guy, <laughs> Uncle Sam, big brother, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So it uh, it um, I I think that's probably one of the most um, well, number one, when when you look at our sphere of control as individuals, we have no control over the political process at all, and that's why I and I think voluntarists, and this is at least one of the arguments against participation in in politics, is that that that's completely outside your sphere of control. You cannot affect anything in there. I mean, the most effective, I think the most effective way to influence um, the political arena is what a, a good friend of mine, Connor Boyack does. He runs a libertarian think tank here in Utah called Libertas Institute, where he um, will sit down with legislatures and influence legislation directly. And to me, that is a lot more effective than, you know, simply trying to run for office or just going out and voting or trying to get people to vote. You know what I mean? Because he's he's because of his efforts, he's um, he's helped pass a lot of legislation that's going to be voted on anyways. You know, he's not out there promoting candidates at all, and he's not saying go vote. Mm -hmm. He's saying these guys are here; they're going to vote on something. I'm going to do what I can to influence it, and so he's helped pass a lot of measures to rein back some of the police state. Um, he's trying to get medical marijuana passed here in Utah. Mm -hmm. um, he's relaxed the already very relaxed homeschooling laws. He's done a lot of good, and that's probably the only area that I've seen where an individual within his sphere of control can be effective when it comes to the political arena. Outside of that, to me, it's just it's just complete wasted time. And so when it when it comes to sphere of control, your house, right? Your home is your sphere of control. And, 
and and, he, and only then to an extent, right? Mm -hmm. Your wife, unless you get violent, is not going to just do anything you want. You've got to persuade her. Same with your kids. Mm -hmm. Again, unless you get violent, unless you use the power, the greater power that you have over them to get your way, you've got to use persuasion. Okay, so, you know, really their sphere of control ends at your fingertips, right? So that's why I think that you know, every libertarian, every anarchist, every voluntarist should first be a radical, unschooled, under peaceful parent at home. They should be applying these principles every day with their kids, in their families, in their homes. And then that, I think, will be, you know, the kids will grow up and take that out into the world with them. And hopefully that, that snowball effect will, will grow and change the, the surrounding culture and change attitudes towards, um, towards liberty. And then, you know, along with technological revolution, which is amazing. It, you know, and that's kind of a thing too. Unschoolers, there's such a high percentage of unschoolers that become entrepreneurs. That's like a thing. Yeah, yeah. So many of them do. And so that's what we need is more of as entrepreneurs and, and thinkers who come up with these great ideas. And, mm -hmm. and so going out there, you know, raising unschoolers and, you know, basically raising entrepreneurs, in other words, you know, and, and, Parents can approach that differently and some parents can, can, you know, there's things you can do, I think, to, to help your kids in that regard. And a lot of, a lot of parents, myself included, are a little more risk averse. I think because we were raised with schooling, we were raised with people telling us what to do. Mm. We're not entrepreneurial minded. I have begun to change um, that mindset recently, but it's still something that that's difficult to do because you do, you like that safety net, right? Mm. Anyway, so... Um, yeah, I think that's just, you know, when we talk about our sphere of control, I think that's, that's the most effective thing we can do is, is raise the next generation in liberty. Yeah. Yeah. And one interesting thing, uh, well, my family, um, I grew up, um, with a family of Democrats <laughs> and I mean, I really, care, I, didn't, I didn't really, you too. Yeah. I didn't really care about politics, you know, growing up, I just wasn't interested. It wasn't, you know, something that I thought could affect my life in any measurable way. So I focused on other things like, you know, my, um, you know, philosophy and astronomy and cosmology and things like that, chess piano. But, um, you know, as I learned about volunteerism, it, it just, it made, it, it, it simplified politics and it made sense, you know, and uh, because otherwise, you know, it, it's like, why would anybody want to care about this referendum or that referendum or this law? Because, you know, even if you do read the law itself, you can barely understand it because <laughs> the legalese that they use, it's, it's made, yeah. it's made, it's like purposefully made to be obscure, right? And, uh and and to to you know deter people from wanting to try to understand it themselves right and so and that's unfortunate and so um so yeah that's what that's what really um got me into it and and so you know with the homeschooling uh and the unschooling um that's been a point of a point of contention <laughs> with my family a lot uh and one of the interesting things uh is the recent things i was getting is um is the whole respect your elders idea, you know, like, and which is the exactly the reason why I love that they're not in school is <laughs> because they they don't see a power differential between um, adults and them. You know, my kids, they mm -hmm. when they go out into the world, they speak to adults as equals, as peers, right? Because that's how I like to treat my kids as an equal, as a peer, not as, you know, I'm older, stronger, therefore you respect me just because of that, you know? Um, mm -hmm. and, and so it's not about respecting your elders just because they're older than you, you know, it's about respecting everybody or m perhaps even, um, <laughs> respecting only those people that deserve it or that have earned that respect through their actions, right? Through their deeds. Um, and so that is, uh, something I'm quite, quite proud of that, that they're not, they're not victim to the appeal to authority, <laughs> right? That all of us have been, you know beaten over the head with, you know, it's the unwritten, one of the unwritten lessons that we learn after the 12 years of indoctrination. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Do, do you see that with your kids too, the way they talk to adults? Yeah, my, my kids are very respectful. It's actually, um, it's kind of interesting because I'm always, you know, like my parents will take them for a weekend or whatever and, and they'll tell me how wonderful they were. But what's interesting, as soon as me and my wife are back in their lives, that's when sort of the emotional the emotional stuff starts to come out. And I think the reason for that is because of the security they feel with us. They allow themselves to be far more emotional with us than they do with 
with people they're not as close to. And, and, and in my opinion, that shows emotional maturity. Mm. And so they're, you know, they're, they're, when we're not around, they get along better with each other. They're a lot more pleasant. They're a lot more respectful of others um, than when we are around. And I think a typical parent would, you know, would complain and whine about that saying, why are you guys so bad when, like, I remember growing up, my mom used to cry and whine about us being more respectful to our teachers than to her. Hmm. <laughs> and and now I think about it. Well, I, I think it's because, you know, we feel more secure with you. So we, we allow our emotional side to come out. And mm-hmm. remember, we're little kids yeah. and we don't have as, as good a control mm-hmm. when we don't feel that pressure to, to, to control. And so seeing that in my kids, I, I think has been um, pretty cool. So... Yeah, that's nice, and and uh, and that reminds me of another thing. Like uh, you know, you tell somebody that you're um, homeschooling or unschooling, and one of the first things they say is, "Well, if you give kids the freedom to do what they want, they're just gonna play games all day, go on the computer, play video games, they're just gonna waste their days away. <laughs> you know, end up, I don't know, like uh, you know, worthless bum with no skills. You know, um, and and one thing that I I like to point out is that perhaps when a child is forced to go to an institution for eight hours a day and then come home and then they have to do additional homework where they can't do what they want to do, right? So more time is taken away. And then, you know, maybe even during the week, they barely can do anything they want to do because they got to go to bed because they got to wake up at six the next Mm -hmm. morning. So maybe the weekends is the only time they they can do whatever they want to do. And so they don't want to do anything related to books or dittos or papers. And they just want to play video games the whole time or watch TV because they're like deprogramming. (laughs) They're like, that's their relaxation. And so the, the conclusion is, you see, if he could do what he wanted, he would do that all the time. It's, it's, yeah, that's uh, that's. I'm sure there's a logical fallacy there. I don't know what it's called, but yeah, just to take that idea that I mean, number one, when you when you give them time to do what they want, that's their time, and they're going to soak up as much as that fun of that fun stuff as possible. Mm-hmm. But when every hour is their time, that's not what that's not what happens. The kid kids aren't using what they're doing as an escape right and that's mm-hmm. i don't know if you've done any studying on um addiction uh my my podcast co-host phil eager is has taught me a little bit um channeling gabor mate who's done a lot on addiction and nice. what addiction is in his opinion and it makes sense to me um is addiction is is escapism mm-hmm. okay it's right, when yeah. your life either has been or currently is you know, 90 on the happiness scale, mm-hmm. you, you, you do something or you consume something that takes your happiness up to 130, 140. Mm-hmm. And then when you're not doing that thing, you drop back down to 90 or even below that, mm-hmm. you long for that happiness again. And so over and over, the more you do that, that, that thing becomes your escape. And that's where addiction is born. Now, I think with, with people who are not traumatized as children and are not traumatized in their day-to-day life with other people telling them what to do, their default happiness level is more like 120. And so when they do those things, it takes it up to maybe 130. But there's not as big of a difference mm. in the two states of, of of happiness. And so they don't crave for that as much as the person mm-hmm. who's got a, a default happiness level of a lot lower. Mm-hmm. That's kind of my understanding in a nutshell of Gabor Mate's approach to addiction. And I think he's done some research that has supported that. So, so yeah, I think kids can become addicted to video games. And it's because video games are a form of escape from their lives, their miserable lives for them. And so they want that every chance they get. But when you look at that situation as a person and say, if we took away school, he'd be doing that all day long. I think that's true for like six months while they're in that de-schooling process, which is a thing that that people who are transitioning from schooling to unschooling, especially if their kids have been in school for a few years, they need to pay attention to and they need to realize that there is going to be a de-schooling. And there's a lot of good writing that you can um, you can read on on what that looks like and how to how to deal with that as a family. Then, yeah, I think I think your kid is going to. Um, use that to de-school. He's going to be on there 24-7. But at some point, 
it's going to be easy to get him off it to do a different activity. It's not going to be a fight and a struggle because it's not like he's holding on to his his drugs and saying, no, you can't have it. This is my alcohol or this is, you know what I mean? Because it's no longer, it's no longer an escape for him because his general contentment level has risen back up to where a healthy person should be. So, yeah, I mean, my, my kids, um, you know, they're, they're, it's very easy to say, okay, let's go do this activity and leave the house. But when we don't have anything scheduled, they are either on the TV or they're on the computer. But when they're on the computer, they're either, you know, browsing YouTube or they're playing a game. Most of the time, they're on Skype with friends, oftentimes multiple friends, hmm. doing something cooperative in some video game, whether it's Minecraft or Gary's Mod or, you know, Quake Live or whatever. And so, I mean, play is the best way um, to approach education for children. I mean, that's, that's in our DNA. We are a play-based species. Right. That's what Peter Gray talks about. So if they're playing and they're having a joyous, a joyful life, then when the time comes for them to learn, maybe like a skill, right? Like math, reading, writing, those are skills. Mm -hmm. Those aren't facts, right? There's two things you'll learn, either facts or skills. Mm -hmm. Then they're going to be, I think they're going to be ready and eager to learn that because it's, it's like, an achievement in a video game, you know, they've got to learn this to go to the next level and they, mm. they see that. And so when they're ready to learn it, they, they just will. And I mean, unschoolers all the time are reporting on their kids picking up a book and teaching themselves to read. Now, I don't, I don't think that's in general what it is. I, I think it might take some, some more hands on with mom and dad reading to them. And we read to our kids every night, um, you know, and, and, you know, they're always looking at text on the screen. You know, my, my son can read now. He, we, my wife taught him to read and he kind of solidified that through preschool. And then my daughter, she's, you know, they do letter games and stuff with her, you know, completely voluntary and she loves it and it's fun and she's learning her letters. And at some point, because so much text is around her, she's going to, she's going to start reading. I don't have any doubt of that. So, and, you know, and then, you know, later on in a few years, it'll be mathematics, you know, at some point, you know, my, my son, he's never really had formal mathematics lessons, but he can do basic addition and subtraction. And, mm-hmm. you know, when the time comes for him to learn the higher forms of math, multiplication, division, fractions, you know, depending on, depending on where his passions take him, I, I don't think that's, you know, it's going to be, I mean, just like he's got to turn on the computer to use it. He's got to learn this skill in order to do what he wants to do. And you see that with unschoolers all the time is, is when it's time, when they need this, the prerequisite skill to do what they really want to do, they pick it up no problem. And if he's learning multiplication or division at 12, he's going to pick it up in a day. I have no doubt of that. I mean, you can't tell me that a 16 year old, you know, can't learn to do what we all learn to do at eight years old. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. His mind is developed enough that it's very easy to pick up these very simple concepts, you know? So it's, it's not anything I'm worried about, but a lot of people are worried about that, especially when they see that unschoolers don't put a lot of um, emphasis on some of those skills. You know, they, the emphasis is really, what is your passion and let's help you do it. And then the skills sort of come Mm -hmm. sort of happen organically along the way. But you know, there is that fear. And so there is a lot of reluctancy. So that's why I decided to, put together to edit a book written by unschooling dads for um, wives who want to move into unschooling, either from schooling or from homeschooling, a more structured homeschooling. They want to move into unschooling, but their husbands are reluctant, Mm. you know, at any, at any degree, either a little bit reluctant or a lot. Mm. So I wanted to, you know, I, I put the call out there for unschooling dads all along the spectrum from 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 people who don't even have kids yet that are already convinced of unschooling to people whose kids are adults now. And I'm like, can you write me a chapter? Here's here's some things to think about. And just pretty much, you know, what's your experience been? Just give it to me in your words, you know, and it's not scholarly or anything like that. And so that's the call I put out. I got maybe 30 commitments. I've received a little less than half of that um, with, you know, a couple of weeks left on 
kind of a semi hard deadline. <laughs> I would like to get it all together. And I'm, and I'm editing these as they come in and then I just got to put it in a file and, and get a cover made and then I can, I can publish that. And my goal is by the end of August so that moms can give it to their husbands when their kids are just starting the school year and, you know, pull them out before it's too late. <laughs> right. Before the dads say, oh, he's already halfway done with the year. Let's let him finish. It's like, no, the year just started. Let's yeah. just pull him right back out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or, you know, stop whatever homeschooling we're doing or at least transition towards. Mm -hmm. uh, for homeschoolers, it's, it's often best to kind of um, slowly transition towards less and less mm -hmm. control over structure and content. So. Yeah, you brought you brought up a good a lot of a lot of points. I uh, wanted to talk about um, one of them is uh, you know the, the idea of deferred gratification when you go to school. It's like you were saying, you know, um, in when when kids go to public school, they can't do what they want to do because they have to go to this institution. They have to listen. They have to memorize for the test. They have to do all these things that they don't want to do voluntarily, um, and. And so when they do get the time to do what they want to do, they cram it as much as possible with, you know, everything that's not school. And uh, <clears throat> and when you don't do that to the kids, when you don't force them to do things, and like you said, when you give, when all of their time, when, when, you know, most of the day is their day, then they don't need to escape, right? <laughs> like, what a radical idea, <laughs> you know? Right. You know, stop, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, some people even equate, um, you know, uh, government schools to child abuse, which I would... I would certainly consider because, you know, although, you know, it's, it's, that would be difficult to tell somebody like your parents or your family, you know, especially if they're trying to convince you of sending your kids to public school. It's like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like the blind leading the blind, you know, the, 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 the abused traumatic minds, you know, trying to do, you know, propagate the, that cycle of violence throughout, you know, the future generations. And, and, uh, and they just don't see that, you know, it's like, it's the idea of force, you know, like, like, you know, kids are born lacking, right? They're born as blank slates, you know, they're born without souls, without spirits, without passion, without drives. And, and it's our job to imprint our whims and desires onto them because they don't have, they don't have a soul. They don't have a spirit. They don't know what they want, right? They're just kids. <laughs> you know, this is the idea. Well, yeah, this, that this, or they're, they're born with an evil soul. It's got to be stamped out of them tamed yeah well I, yeah. yeah it's probably more more uh applied with the with the boys too right that that you know yeah. in general boys you know need more physical activity than the girls and so it's like and so the boys seem to be uh, you know in general more heavily medicated and you know zombified <laughs> to right. to right. uh to uh you know um they say uh conform right to the to the classroom setting which is oh so 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 horrible you know um and and then and then you said before about um you know how some some parents of uh you know about government schools they they worry when they when they talk to unschoolers and homeschoolers you know like w well what if they don't learn math and science and history and all this stuff you know what if they don't learn their division what if they don't learn and and um I was uh, turned on to a, uh, a, uh, a video, a TED Talk by this math teacher in a public school who uh, the, the, t the, the subject of the TED Talk was, you know, the, the math that everyone needs to know uh, is basically what you would need to buy a carpet from, uh, <laughs> from the store. <laughs> That's the extent of the math that everyone really needs to know to be applied to daily life, you know, the <laughs> mm. <laughs> whatever, whatever you need to buy a carpet, which basically could be taught like, you know, within a couple weeks or months or something. But, um, but yeah, so he's basically t telling this audience that no, most of the stuff you learn is useless, is not necessary, is a waste of time. And when you force kids to learn something that is a waste of time, you're robbing them of their life, right? Of their potential, mm -hmm. you're destroying their potential. And uh, and this is what I I tell people, like especially my family members who who, who like to argue with me about this is is it's the idea of uh, the the seen and the unseen, right? Bastiat seen and the unseen, right? Everybody's like, mm -hmm. well, look at you. You went to public school and you turned out okay, <laughs> right? But mm -hmm. uh, and that's of course the scene, right? That's where you, you know, like you know, they say without government we would have, you know, we have NASA, we have you know all these bridges and roads, and we have all these cool military stuff. You know, isn't that awesome? <laughs> that's what they see. But what's not seen is the potential that has been annihilated, you know, as a result of all the force that was instituted um, to bring about those things, right? So. 
you know, <laughs> public school is about force. It's about compulsion. But people choose not to see the gun, right? And then you bring up, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I bring up, you know, compulsory laws and and truancy. You know, what does what, what does a truant officer do? <laughs> you know, he's not your friend. <laughs> he's not, he doesn't want to be your friend. Um, but if you you know, uh, sign your kid up for pub- public school and you don't go, you're going to get a visit from the truancy officer, right? And he's going to do nasty things to your to your, to your your parents if, if you don't go to school. So it's not mm-hmm. a nice thing. You know, there is violence in the background. Yeah, yeah, there is. I uh, was just, you know, when I think back, my my middle school and junior, or excuse me, my, my junior high and high school, we called it middle school, um, years were very probably the worst years of my life i was very depressed um, i was very angry and i i attribute that to not to not having any freedom you know not being able to do the things i wanted to do and having all of these unchosen liabilities thrown on me Mm. um and i do i think back what you know had i not been forced to go to school what 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 would my life during those years have been if I'd have had the choice to choose, you know, yeah. the, the path that I was, that I was on. Um, and it is kind of, you know, it's easy to, to kind of get angry about that, especially towards the people who, you know, were, you know, responsible for creating that situation, you know, the parents, teachers, um, you know, but I mean, you know, it, it, it's easy to get angry, but then it's also easy to kind of see them themselves as, victims of that same system and mm-hmm. it, you know it just goes back to the that first guy who thought it would be better to force somebody else to um to give him his resources rather than going and finding them themselves that mm-hmm. you know that that idea of conquest was born mm-hmm. and from there you know you have large scale conquest which is statism and then the state creates schools and which was a brilliant move by them by the way to create you know to eventually create a compliant citizenry, you know, you, you indoctrinate them, mm-hmm. um, you know, so it goes back centuries. And so it's, you know, it's hard to be angry at anything. And I don't know. I mean, I think it's, I think it can be healthy at least to recognize it and then to look in your own lives of where, of where you're contributing to that and then, and then ceasing to do that, you know, which a lot of people are doing now. A lot of libertarians are, are finally doing that, taking their kids out of schools and, you know, they're stopping to spank and that sort of stuff. And so that's that's why I do what I do with the website, with my writing, with my books. I mean, it is it is part hobby, but it's also part mm, crusade, I guess. <laughs> I've never actually said it like that. Crusade like that. <laughs> it, yeah, it's kind of my righteous crusade is to, to spread the message of peace, I think. And and so, um, you know, that's that's what I try to do. And that's that's exactly what you're doing, you know, and maybe someday you will write a book and you know, and if you are writing regularly now, that mm. that will form a book at some point. Mm. You know, and you just, you just do it. You know, and I I do it not expecting to make any money from it. You know, I don't have ads on my website or anything like that. We do ask for donations on the podcast, and we've gotten you know fifty bucks here and there. It's certainly nothing to live on. Mm. Um, Quit your day job. But it's just <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a labor of love, and it's yeah. um you know I just it, it is it is selfish because I want. I want people around me to share my values and I want to live in a free society. And so I selfishly am trying to teach people how to do that. <laughs> selfishly. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it is, I mean, it's self-interest. Everybody, you know, I, I want to see other people mimic my values and I don't know, it's probably part confirmation and part, <laughs> mm-hmm. I just want to live in a better world and I want my children to. So. Yeah. One, uh, one thing that it reminded me of, of, uh, is when, when I was, in high school, I was interested in philosophy, Eastern and Western philosophy, and I um, and I was reading a little bit on Confucianism. And one Confucius uh, quote that I remember is, "If you want to change the world, um, first uh, you know you change yourself, mm-hmm. and then that and then that will translate out to your family, right? And then that will affect your neighbor, and your town, and then your you know your your village, <laughs> and then the state, and then the country, right? It always starts with the individual, right? Always." And and that's the thing that um, a lot of people tend to overlook when because I, I get this all the time from people who advocate for government school is you know you need you, they say you're so selfish because your kids need the proper um, preparation to 
so that they can be a functioning member of society, right? It's always the mention of the society, right? We, the collective, things like that. And that kind of idea of looking at the society, forget about the individual. It's all about the society, right? The collective. That is exactly <laughs> what Hitler <laughs> did his whole campaign on, right? And same thing with every single politician, basically. It's all about the collective, right? Society, what's good for society, right? And that's such a dangerous way of thinking, right? The hive mentality, collectivist approach, you know? And that is exactly the precursor to things like democide, right, of a population when when the people's liberties have been trampled on so much that they're just unrecognizable. <laughs> they just they don't have any, you know, there's no individuality whatsoever. And uh, and that's definitely the trajectory that we're on, <laughs> you know, it, when you keep talking about what's good for society, what's good for society, <laughs> you know, what's good for society in terms of volunteerism is what's good for the individual. If it's not good for the individual, it's not good for society. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with that. If it's not good for the individual, it's not good for the society. Um, but in the same vein, I think that, you know, I mean, we did evolve in tribes, right? We did evolve in large, small tribes, large families, right? And so I think... You know, I think some of that that tribalism is kind of coming through there and of kind of informing some of those ideas. But it's people who are bent on conquest that are using those sentiments mm -hmm. to, you know, taking it to um, a dangerous extreme, mm -hmm. which the state is a very extremist institution. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, you know, and, and I think in a free society, if we were in a stateless society, number one, I think it would need to be preceded by. A culture of liberty, which I talk about in the book, um, but peaceful parenting and radical unschooling, which are, are two parts of that culture of liberty, that has an effect of binding families together as well as um, encouraging families through that bond to share with one another. And so I, I think it's very likely that in a free society, you would have, and I don't know if we would call it communism or socialism among family units. But then when those family units trade with other family units, you would have markets, you know, because a lot of that is just, you know, people are just selling stuff to people they don't know, you know, over great distances. And, and so you would have markets, um, large scale markets, but then closer to home and whether it's, you know, family based or even maybe just neighborhood based, I think you would see a lot of the sharing type of economy and sort of that um, voluntary communism or voluntary socialism to an extent, I think. I mean, just in my own home, you know, I, I share everything with my kids. You know, they have they have free access. They got to take turns on it. But, you know, so just in my home, we, we share all of our resources. But those resources come into the home through the market. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah, so I think that's that's the extent. And so I think you know, there's a level of the socialism or the communism that is compatible with human nature. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the family. Yeah. I do not believe it's past that point, though. Maybe, you know, family-based traditional neighborhoods where everybody did grow up together and it is sort of kind of an extended non-blood family. Um, some of that stuff, you know, I think there'd be a lot of sharing and that sort of thing. But resources, unless they're grown or made in that community, got to come in through markets. And so... That, that's the extent of, of, I see it, the compatibility with those ideas with human nature. So. Yeah, and the same thing with uh, democracy, um, uh, you know, socialism and democracy. It's like they, they function well on very, very small scales, right? Like, like say, in a family or in a club or, in, let's say, in a church or whatever. Like, you know, small, small scales. Yeah, yeah, you know, you're in a chess club and, yeah, they take a vote, you know. <laughs> and that's not evil, you know. It's just, it's like... It's a it's a voluntary association. You can leave if you want. You're not forced to be there. You know. You know. You don't. Yeah. Have to, you don't have to pay taxes against your will. Um, and the same thing with yeah. I definitely agree that the family unit um, is is more reminiscent of socialism. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you're right. The problem is that people assume like you know what if this works for the family, maybe we should force everyone to be like this. <laughs> yeah. That's the problem, right? When yeah. when uh, because. Because with the family, you know, you're intimately connected with these people. And so 
yeah, family are more likely to share, or maybe your close neighbors, you know, you're more likely to share. But people that you don't know and that you, you, you don't have, you know, you're not friends with, you, you know, why should they share with you? <laughs> and you can't force them to share if they don't want to, right? Because then you're violating their individual liberties, right? So the same thing with democracy. It just does not work when you enlarge it on a grand scale. You know, it just degenerates into tyranny and uh, oppression, you know, because... Um, <laughs> you know, you, you, and in those, in those, you know, in those large scale, uh, you know, economies, yeah, definitely, um, you know, free market capitalism is, you know, in my opinion, I guess we're biased, <laughs> you and I, <laughs> confirmation bias, but it seems that when the markets are free, <laughs> there is the maximum prosperity, right, and growth and wealth that's created out of that, right, because it's only the individuals yeah. that know. So, yeah. <laughs> well, even even in our statist world, um, the states that allow the highest degrees of economic freedom, the, the highest degrees of functioning markets, um, show the highest amounts of wealth, oh, yeah. um, as well as peace, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah, I mean, it, it's just, you know, taking that to, to that conclusion of, okay, let's extend markets into these other realms. Let's extend markets into, um, you know, dispute resolution and into security, into these other things that the state, mm -hmm. Um, you know, um, economic regulations and whatever. Let's just extend um, markets and create markets in these different areas, and I think things would be better again and again and again. So, so, so at the same time, uh, you know, talking about socialism in the family. Um, so uh, another thing that um, I've heard Stefan Molyneux say, and I kind of like this idea, is that um, you know, helping kids to um, to be you know, encourage responsibility, self-reliance is on, um, you know, they can share their things if they want to, right? But if, like, you give a present to your kid, then obviously there's a transfer, right? You're given the present, it's theirs, it's their property, and so they can do with it what they will, right? They can, they can you know, enjoy it, they can share it, or they can destroy it. And if they do destroy it, then then it, it's that's kind of like a lesson right like like <laughs> that that resources are scarce and finite and to replace that requires money or currency which must be obtained through adding value right providing value to society to or <laughs> to uh to the market right so yeah. um, so I, I, at the same time that's a valuable lesson do you do you um what, what do you think about that yeah absolutely yeah my kids have their own um their own personal property i mean they understand that you know the electronics, the big electronics computers. You know, you know, were were purchased by me at one point. Mm -hmm. You know, TV, all that stuff. You know, the the lights are powered through. You know, the bills are paid by me. The house is bought by, yeah. by me. And so they they understand that, um, but they have a lot of their own property. I mean, they're constantly um, given given money by grandparents and stuff. Um, it's it's a Mexican tradition called Domingo. It's like it's kind of like allowance. When oh, you okay. see when you see grandma on Sunday, she gives you a dollar, and so they <laughs> they collect dollars on the weekends. Uh, and they save those, and then they they buy plushies, or you know they'll they'll ask for money for their birthday present that uh -huh. they did last year, and then they took they had you know over a hundred dollars each, and they they my daughter bought a tablet, my son bought a PSP, you know, mm -hmm. so they have these things that that are theirs, and they're completely theirs to control. I can't. And I won't take them from them or even yeah. attempt to. Yeah, yeah. And even and even my stuff like computers and video games, I won't. I don't limit their use of them at all in any way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they they learn self regulation by by self regulating. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the only the only. I don't really want to call it a rule. I want to call it, I guess, more of a principle. Is that when there is a limited number, like right now they kind of both use their own computers. We have three computers in the house, the one I'm using right now, and then there's two others. And so they can, they can play their, their, each of their computers and, and there's no conflict, but like there's only one big TV with the Amazon fire TV on it. And so if there's something on there they want to use, they've got to, they got to take turns. And so they, sure. they understand the concept of taking turns. Other than that, there's, there's no limits. Mm-hmm. Other than how they use it, I mean, they can't they can't be destructive towards it or anything like that. And if if they are, then they know that mm -hmm. I'll be unhappy, and mm -hmm. you know, then I'll I'll probably seek restitution <laughs> by confiscating their. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, you know? uh, it's it's hard, you know. Like like for me, before I had kids and my wife too, uh, you know, I remember having a conversation like, um, so so when we have kids, um, 
if they misbehave, we're going to spank, right? And and we said, yeah, yeah, I guess we'll spank. You know, it just makes sense. <laughs> so like it wasn't given a second thought. And the reason was, I think, because we were both treated like that as children. Yeah. And so, you know, it only makes sense. It's this was that you, you appeal, appeal to antiquity. You know, if my, my parents did it, their parents did it, why wouldn't I do it? <laughs> just, right. Yeah, right. Everybody's doing it, so just do it. <laughs> um, and th- thankfully, when my son was born, uh, and uh, he was uh, just around one. I, I, uh, which my my wife sent me the uh, Stefan Molyneux um, truth about spanking video, and mm. oh, changed my world. And Excellent. and that's how I learned about you know through that I learned about you know volunteerism and free markets and things like that. So nice. um, that was my introduction to peaceful parenting as well. Um, and so I'm very very grateful to him. You know he's done so much great work in that sense. You know. Um, so I really am a fan of, of his work, but yeah, so, so the spanking is, um, it's just amazing how it's so automatic to some people, you know, like your kid does something bad, you hit him, you know, it's just a little, t- it's just a little tap. It's just, <laughs> you know, and it's funny when people try to, try to, um, distinguish, you know, it's not abuse. I'm not abusing him. I'm just disciplining him and he understands, and he yeah. understands that I love him when I hit him. <laughs> which is the most schizophrenic way of describing it, right? <laughs> he understands I love I'm doing this because I love you. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> it's very it's very painful, but yeah, it's amazing how these things are are so ingrained in so many people, you know? Um and then the double standard of, you know, like, you know, you hit your friend it's assault, you hit your wife it's, you know, domestic abuse, and you hit your your child it's discipline. <laughs> and yeah. it's, and it's acceptable, right? <laughs> yeah, I I have a chapter on on discipline in my, my spanking book, my no, uh, no hitting, um, that talks about discipline and, you know, discipline, the root of discipline is disciple, which means to guide, you know, a disciple, somebody who follows you. So discipline is, Mm -hmm. is guiding somebody. Mm -hmm. And so this euphemism that, well, spanking is already a euphemism for, uh, you know, hitting your kid. And then discipline is a euphemism for spanking. And so you've got this, you know, you know, two degrees away from what you're actually doing to try to make it sound um, more palatable, I guess. But anyway, so my wife grew up in Mexico City, um, and she was never spanked. She was never yelled at um, or anything, you know, and, and her family bond with her parents and her sisters is very strong. But when we, when my son got old enough where I felt I needed to start spanking him, probably around three years old, mm. It was hard for her to see me do that, mm. but as I did it, eventually that um, resistance broke down in her, mm. and then she started doing it. Oh. You know, but it, it it took some time to break through that. Um, you know, her resistance to that idea because she wasn't raised with that. So mm. had I not been there, or had I had a different attitude at the time, um. You know, my kids never would have been spanked in it, and she would have never even considered spanking, you know, because oh. she didn't consider spanking until I was like, no, it's okay, you know, and convincing her that it's okay and this and that. And mm. Biggest regret of my life is ever doing that. Um, so, anyways, obviously we don't do it now. Um, we haven't done it for four and a half years. Mm. So he was five when, when we stopped. Anyway, so, yeah, people who aren't raised that way, which I hope when my kids are older now, like, my son, I mean, he remembers it, and so he could have some, you know, some some scars there, in, you know, from his past, and it might come out, and he might feel the urge to spank his kids. I hope not. Um, my other kids, my daughter, you know, I, I, I hope that they'll, you know, approach it like my wife did, like completely a completely foreign idea. Why would I ever hit a kid, you know? So that's that's my hope. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I, was, I uh, interviewed uh, Dana Martin, um, the uh, radical unschooler. Mm. I'm sure you've heard of her. Um, mm-hmm. And one thing that she said with me that stayed with me was, uh, "Kindness is revolutionary." <laughs> and isn't that such a a shocking statement that we have to make? Like, what kind of society are we living in that kindness is revolutionary? <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. And, and it just illustrates the the undercurrent of violence that uh, you know permeates our society you know and uh, you know starts in a home with authoritative parenting spanking you know corporal punishment and you know and and uh, you know um, and then and then in public schools you know with uh, all the 
all the crap that they put up with and, you know, just destroying their creativity and their imagination, their desire, their will, their, their, their love of learning <laughs> is completely, you know, snuffed out. And, and so, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a cycle of violence, right? And so, and so I love it that what we're doing is we're breaking that cycle. That's, I really love that. Um, and, and it's like, it's like we're going against the current, you know, it's like the whole, the whole river is going this way and we're going this way. <laughs> and everyone else is like, what are you doing? Turn around. What are you doing? <laughs> You're like, no, this is immoral. We're going this way. Sorry. <laughs> or we're, we're trying to change the current, right? Going, going, going the other way. Um, yeah. so yeah. Yeah. That can be a, that can be a really tough thing, especially when you're alone and you're, you're, you know, I mean, as an anarchist or libertarian, you're already within your neighborhoods and whatever. You're yeah. already pretty much alone yeah. right. in your beliefs and, and usually among your families. And then you've got to add insult to injury and become <laughs> a peaceful parent and an unschooler. You really are making things stressful for yourself. <laughs> and those things can be stressful when you are when you do have that opposition yeah. from people who are so close to you. So what I highly recommend doing is finding other local unschoolers, you know, just like you would find other local libertarians. Um, find the unschooling groups in your area and really start to get involved with them. Um, here in Salt Lake, we have, it, it actually did start, it started with me, uh, Phil, my co-host, and another friend of ours. We got together to have um, dinner one Saturday night and just, you know, talked about things and just kind of had that adult interaction that we didn't really get a lot of being so involved with our kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we were like, hey, let's let's invite more people from this. So the next month, we invited more people. And we've been going on over uh, about a year and a half now. Mm-hmm. And we call it Epic Night of Epicness. <laughs> so it's every, <laughs> nice. it's every fourth Saturday. We go to a, a village inn, uh, which is a diner, you know, like a Denny's. I don't know if you have any of those where you live. Yeah. Um, and we just, you know, people come. You know, the, the couple hours that we're there, people come at any time. Most people kind of show up at the beginning and we just we just eat and chat and just kind of support each other and what we're doing, you know, and, and we're all either unschoolers or partial unschoolers or, you know, one lady, she's got a couple daughters that are preteens, but they really like school. And so they're in school, but it's really a, their choice because she, she doesn't force them to go or anything. And she's more than happy to let them stay home. I think they they just like the social aspect. That's that's kind of what hooks kids too is the friends and the social aspect, and they don't want to go home and then lose those friends. And so that's yeah, right, kind of exactly. That. Yeah. Anyway, and so that's something we've been doing, and we even have bowling nights quarterly. Um, this weekend, we actually have our first family retreat with the group. It's called Epic Family Retreat of Epicness, <laughs> and it's north at a place called Bear Lake, um, which is a huge lake very blue water it's got great beaches mm-hmm. um and we'll just be at a, a a resort right there on the beach and there's probably 10 families that are going to be there and we're just going to have you know two nights of just awesome fun so that's what you got to do you've got to find like-minded individuals whether it's politics or um the unschooling and the peaceful parenting and then you've got to weekly do what you can to get together and get something started to where you can support each other. Since we've been doing that, things have been easier. You know, I've, I've, I haven't felt as much like a rebel as a loner, as somebody who's not, you know, somebody swimming against the current because now I've got, you know, a school of fish swimming with me against yeah. the current cool. and we support each other. And so I definitely recommend that if you're going to go on this path, try to find local people and you'll find a lot of, You'll find, if you're looking for unschooling groups, which you should find, and you can just find these groups on Facebook pretty easily, a lot of those people probably won't be libertarians. They'll just be, you know, unschoolers and, yeah, yeah. you know, who probably came from homeschooling. And that's good. You, you definitely need that support too. And and a lot of times they organize activities that you can do together. And your kids, my kids have made friends with people in these groups and they play online with them. And, you know, my daughter's got a best friend who's a kid. And we're good friends with the parents, and and the, and those parents happen to be anarchists too, which is which is cool. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so you know you you do, and and because they're already kind of in that counterculture as unschoolers, they're kind of already thinking about those. I mean, they don't identify it as anarchist ideas, but they're kind of already leaning that way. 
pay, which is kind of cool. Because then as you talk with them and get to know them, you kind of get that, you can feel that that anti-establishment attitude coming from them, which is great. Because that can segue into a lot of cool conversations while the kids are playing. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah that- I definitely recommend doing that, getting yourself a group, um, a community together. It's it's going to make your your experience a lot better. So. Yeah, the uh, yeah the way you just described that um, is is basically the primary argument that I say, or the primary response I say to people. You know, what about the socialization? <laughs> because yeah. they have this idea that I, um, you know, when I say homeschooling, I, I don't usually say unschooling because like homeschooling is radical enough for, for most people. I just say homeschooling, yeah. homeschooling, and so and so they're like, it's it's like they think that you know I lock my kids in a room, throw in books, maybe you know push food under the under the under the you know the door and and that's it that's the extent you know read that you know do your homework and it's like whatever they do in school that's what we're doing at home and i have to you know explain you know what the whole passion driven education and you know find out what their interests are and everything and also um yeah that's actually you're right it's an excellent uh, it's an excellent thing to do we um do not spend um like every day we go out basically every day we go out and we do we do meet new people we there are a bunch of uh, facebook groups i'm a part of and um i uh yeah i meet a bunch of a bunch of families around here and yeah there's a good there's a good amount of them um but i think um i mean i met one just one family the guy the father is a uh he, he listens to stuff on Molyneux, so he's kind of a volunteerist but i'm definitely much more um, you know, into it than he is, but that's the closest I've come. Everybody else is not an anarchist or a volunteerist at all, and so it's kind of funny. You know, I meet all these people, and the common denominator is you know homeschooling, which is great, but uh, that's just the beginning. You know, then I can, yeah. I can, you can get in slowly. You know, not coercively, of course, but slowly start talking about you know, you know, if government can't do public school right then what else can they not do <laughs> and, right so so I, I find it helpful to to um to get people to think about everything else and uh and volunteerism yeah. and things like that so so uh, so yeah we're always with people we're always you know going out like tomorrow uh we're gonna go to the city uh we're gonna go to a liberty science museum really exciting it's gonna be their, nice. their second time there um yeah so they're really excited about that with with their friends uh this this, this other family with their two kids um but uh, yeah, always you're right. Always have to get out, you know, and meet new people, and you know, and of course, it it's not like the sterile, homogeneous environment in the government schools where like everybody is the same age. <laughs> of course not. You know, you go out in public, and everybody's different ages, and that's the beautiful thing yeah. that everybody is different ages. You know, um, yeah, that's how they learn the best, right? When they're around older kids and younger kids, you know. So I absolutely love that. Um, so, so, um, I don't want to keep you too long, uh, but, uh, is there anything that you want to finish up with any, any message that you would give to, uh, you know, people, you know, you know, prospective homeschoolers, run schoolers that are unsure, like maybe on the fence and, you know, what, what kind of, uh, uh, you know, message would you give them? Well, um, yeah, I mean, if, if you're on the fence about unschooling and, and whether you're, you're still a schooler or a homeschooler. I, I would meet other unschooling families. And, and one of the best ways to do that is to go. A couple of years ago, we went to an unschooling conference in Vancouver, Washington. They have these at hotels, you know, and, and they just have different workshops and panels where grown unschoolers or, you know, um, adults whose, whose kids are, are older, they just get up and talk about unschooling. And it gives you a chance to sort of see the unschooling community up close and personal as well as to meet and to chat with with kids who are not or adults who grew up this way and to really feel the energy that comes from them and to see really what it's all about i mean there's so there's the conference there there's a conference in san diego there's one um in um phoenix arizona there's one in albuquerque new mexico there's some in minnesota there's some in ohio um, I think even in New Hampshire, there's one in Texas. They're all over. Just go to Google and search unschooling conference and you'll find something that's probably not more than a 10 hour drive at the most from where you're at. There's even a couple of unschooling summer camps 
Mm-hmm. That's like two week long summer camps, one in Portland and one in, I think, Tennessee called the uh, not back to school camp that I'm, I'm hoping to get my kids interested in when they're teenagers, because I think that could be a really fun experience for them. Mm-hmm. So you, you really just got to immerse yourself in the unschooling world mm-hmm. in order to, to eventually get it and say, OK, this is what we want to do. It's, it's like that with anything, though. You know, you got to immerse yourself in it. You know, mm-hmm. if you're going to learn a new language, you got to immerse yourself in it. So. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's uh and, and actually, just before we go, I just want to let you know, um, uh, I, I interviewed this woman, um, her name is Betty Ann, uh, and she is 55, and she has five kids, and the first three, she unschooled in the 80s. <laughs> yeah. So, you can imagine how now, with the internet, you know, with Skype, with all these lightning fast transmission of ideas that that's available to us um even now people and, and all the resources available people are still skeptical and unsure about homeschooling and unschooling imagine at that time in the 80s yeah. you know, calling yourself and actually she did she didn't even know the term unschooling until she read like john holt and and other writers like that and she's like oh unschooling that's what we're doing <laughs> she, he, she he coined it yeah 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 right so yeah. so um it was amazing and and she was basically the only one in her neighborhood doing it so but still her kids um you know became good friends with the with the with the kids going to school in her neighborhood and uh and so yeah they uh, they still had a great time and uh <laughs> and one thing cuz she had mostly daughters and one thing that um the uh the daughters were worried about but of not going to school is you know nobody's going to ask me to the prom <laughs> <laughs> and so and so what ended up happening is they got asked so many times to so many different proms that they went they they ended up going to more proms than a typical mm. <laughs> kid in public school <laughs> which is really funny. So uh so yeah, you're right. You got to immerse yourself, you know, don't be shy, go out, meet, you know, meet other people um and you know, it helps yeah, I mean, it, it encourages, you know, the parents to be social if they're not naturally social. And, and the kids, they just thrive in that, you know, meeting new kids. My, my kids are so excited whenever we go out and I say, you know, we're going to meet a new family. And then they get so excited, you know, yay, new, <laughs> new kids, you know. So, uh, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Um, so, yeah, so before we go, can you just um, just plug your, your websites and your books w- once again just so, so people don't forget it? <laughs> Yeah, just everythingvoluntary.com. Hit the publications link at the top. You can see the books there. Hit the podcast link at the top. Um, the podcast is sort of kind of slowed right now, trying to get it ramped back up. Um, my co-host and I both have gone through some transitions in our life. I'm in a new a new job. He's a stay-at-home dad now. And so the, things have been kind of slow. We are planning on recording in a couple of days. Um, everythingvoluntary.com, largeprintlibrary.com. You can get to all of those things at SkylarJCollins.com, which is my personal website, which is really just kind of contains links to all my stuff. So, Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Very good. Awesome conversation, Skylar. Thanks yeah. a lot. I really appreciate it. Um, so, so if anybody wants to donate to this show, uh, except Bitcoin or PayPal, just like Skylar said, this is a labor of love. <laughs> you know, we're not making a... We're not rolling in the dough as a result of this. <laughs> uh, although, you know, rolling in the dough would be fiat currency dough, so it'd be worthless anyway. But, but anyway, so we're not rolling in, <laughs> we're not rolling in anything. But we are doing it as a passion, spreading ideas because that's how you change. That's how you change the course of history, right? It's only through the spread of ideas. Um, you know, it's not not through violence. It's you know not through Molotov cocktails. <laughs> it's through talking, educating. And, uh, you know, informing people about what's possible when you take violence out of the equation. <laughs> you know, what a what a what an amazing idea. <laughs> what, living what a, by example. Living yeah. by example. Exactly. Living by example is most uh, the best way to teach your kid is, you know, words are one thing. But if when your actions contradict your words, then you got a problem. <laughs> and they they and they, be, they end up confused, too. So uh, very cool. Thank you very much, Skylar. Awesome conversation. Uh, so this is um, uh, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and theseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.